Hello, Deepak. Good to Hi, see you. Mohit. Good to see you. Yeah, you're looking yeah. nice with that big beard of yours. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you very much. You've got a good backdrop. You're sitting in your garden, yeah. I guess. Lovely. Yes. Lovely. Yeah. I'm just checking how many attendees we have. Uh, we have people coming in. Lovely. Okay. And uh, there's still people joining in. There's Nishan, there's Amanda, Pramod Singh, Prashant. Welcome, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you all here. Namisha, Shruti, Radhika, lovely. And we've got, okay, good evening, Salil. Good evening, Fareen. Good evening, how are you? So friends, we've got, we've got um, Deepak Dalal with us. He's an old friend and a big time conservationist, a supporter of conservation, who has traveled with us in, in the past. And I'm so delighted to have him here today. He is the master of storytelling, wildlife storytelling for children. And, you know, if you've read any of his books, I mean, if you haven't, then you really missed a lot. So, so today I've, I've got Deepak here to talk to us about uh, you know, various nuances of uh, wildlife storytelling. It's one past five, so I won't wait any longer. Let me start with his introduction, and then I'll introduce myself, and then we get started with whatever we need to ask and move from him. So Deepak, uh, Deepak Dalal gave up a career in chemical engineering to write books for children. He lives in Pune with his wife, two daughters, and several dogs and cats. He enjoys wildlife, nature, and the outdoors. All his stories have a strong conservation theme. So this is pretty much in sync with what we do, Deepak. Um, cats and dogs and uh, you know, children and writing things. So that's lovely. Absolutely fantastic. I'll, I'll quickly introduce myself. I am Mohit Agarwal. I'm an experiential ecotourism specialist. I'm the founder of Asian Adventures, which is a 26-year-old travel company. And I'm also, um, so this Asian Adventures is, the, is, the, uh, is India's number one bird-watching company. It's the largest bird-watching company in India. I'm also blessed with four children. I've got a son, a daughter, and two non-humans. So one is a Labrador, and the other one is escapee African Grey. Oh, wow somebody's office and we didn't know what to do with it. So, uh, so this friend called and said, look, I have kept him here for a month. Now I don't know if it's him or her, but can you do something about it? So I said, well, you know, send him to me. And ever since he's been here, he was a little scared. So I spoke to him and told him, I said, look, I am your friend for life. And you're going to be here with me. So everything that you do, I do, whatever uh -huh. I do. You know, so this is how my relationship with that African grey is. Wonderful. He's such a cutie. Great. So, so Deepak, I, I'm interested uh, that people know a bit more about you. Uh, how did your interest in wildlife develop? Uh, thank you so much, Mohit. Um, my interest in wildlife, actually, I was a Bombay wala. I grew up in Mumbai, and you know, concrete jungle, even in those days, you know, you didn't do much as far as wildlife or forest, you knew nothing about those things. But one day, I think when I was in the sixth standard, my parents sent me off to a boarding school in South India. And that school changed everything. It was set over 750 acres and there were forests. And to get from one class to another, you might have to walk one kilometer. It was a school of hard knocks you know, board, boarding schools in those days, colonial hangovers, a lot of bullying. And a lot of people left the school, but I hung through in spite of all this. I don't know what it was then, but later on, I think it just struck me. It was just the forests, the beauty of the place, the, being in touch with nature. And that from one thing to another, nature, wildlife, and that's how things happen. It was, I think my exposure as a kid, I left Mumbai and I spent time in this place near Uti is a school called Lawrence School La Pair. And uh, I think that changed me as a person, just set my life in a different way because of the connection I got with nature out there. Fantastic. You know, yeah, so those are the days, those are the times when everything changes. You know, I come from Amritsar, 
and we used to have um, Parsi teachers. And one of them, Mr. Pesi, he used to be a hunter and he used to teach us photography. So he used to take us to Satluj and, uh, you know, to Satluj to show us crocodiles. And I was averse to killing. So I tell Mr. Pesi, I say, you can't kill crocodiles. You know, it took him two years to realize it and he stopped killing. He says, I'm going to teach you guys photography and this. So we used to have that Aqua 3 camera, which used to <laughs> cost some 20 rupees or something like that. And the film used to cost 10 rupees. So that was a lot of money then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how did you start writing books? Well, you know, I books came about simply because I started traveling a lot in India. And I came across these beautiful places. I went to the luxury pylons, the Himalayas, so many different parts of the Himalayas. I mean, the Himalayas are huge. Each one was so beautiful. Um, I went through forests. I walked down the coastline. And I just saw a beautiful wild India. And, you know, you read all these books as kids. And there's, they're beautiful stories. I mean, right from today's Harry Potter to the Biggles and the, uh, you know, the books which we grew up on. Fabulous books. But they were there was not a single story set in india in wilderness areas except of course ruskin bond and uh, but you know stories set in these different wilderness de destinations of india i just saw it was nobody had done it and i love these places and i just thought how do i make people aware of these places and then it struck me what about writing stories and that's what i did i traveled to these places and i set stories out there it was just my love for these places that inspired me to write. And the fact that there were no uh, stories set in these lovely destinations of India. And my stories are basically destination based. Now, yeah. I go to a destination and I set stories there. I got Ladakh Adventure, Lakshadweep Adventure, Ranthambore Adventure, Sayadri Adventure. They're all basically location based stories. But they also for children and birds. So so they related to birds and they the children. So how come? So 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 why so much focus on children and not? Uh, I mean, well, I just discovered that uh, children, you can they, adults basically have hardened out. Whatever their views on life, etc., it's very hard to change it beyond a point. But children, particularly in that fifth, sixth, seventh standard, you're talking about eleven to fifth to 13 years old, are very moldable at that time. If you reach out at that time, particularly if you've got stories which have got to do with conservation, about wildlife, about travel, you can actually go out there and tweak their hearts, bring out compassion, bring out love for wildlife. It is that period, is that period. You know, what happens with adults, you actually miss that bus already. Either they are there or they're not there. It's a far more difficult task. And therefore, I chose children. And also, the fact is that there were no adventure stories set in these places. And uh, that's, and I guess I've never really grown up. So yeah. I, I still think like a kid and, you know, and uh, yeah. Yeah. So we have this girl um, in our office. And she is, you know, she's a grown up girl. And she, she's uh, very hardworking. But, you know, when she's outdoors, she's a little child. Because she'll talk to a stone, she'll talk to her shoes, she'll talk to anything. And if you give her a round pillar, she'll just go round and round singing. You know, now, you know, that's that's being you, you know, that's being a child. And that's the, you know, that's where we all need to be. That when we are ourselves, we need to understand our being. So I think it's important for all of us to understand the power of stories. So anyway, I'm not going to go on and on with that. Uh, Deepak, over to you. Would you like to start with this slide presentation? Because a lot of people will be enthralled with that. Okay, let me just give a little introduction to this, uh, yeah. a little about uh, writing stories. Um, when you write stories, I mean, I've, I've always believed the best way of communicating with uh, anybody is through a story. Whether it's, you know, whether it's history, you know, book, we were taught so many dates when we were kids, right? That on this date, this happened, on that date, that happened, and you had exams testing you on these dates. If that, if all those dates came through in the form of a story, somebody wrote a story about all that happened at that time, those dates would come automatically in your head. And that's the power of storytelling, that you learn without actually going through the effort of learning. 
you know, in the sense it comes automatically, it comes without any this thing. And there is a great power that stories have. And uh, that's really, and I enjoy this entire process of creating stories. And when you go about creating a story, the one good thing is that you need to have, you need to come up with a really, really good story. And how does one do that? How does one come up with a really good story? I, the biggest crux to this whole thing is research. You know, it's particularly writing wildlife stories of the kind I do, which are set in uh, wilderness destinations. You have to research these stories properly. This, these cannot be written by sitting, say, now I live in Pune, and imagining a story in Bandavgarh or Rantambor or Ladakh. It doesn't happen. You have to go there. You've got to spend time, quality time, researching your stories. Uh, I've been, since my stories are all wildlife-based stories, I've always reached out to people studying wildlife in the areas I set my stories. Like, for example, when I wanted to write a book on the Andaman Islands, I reached out to Dr. Ravi Sankaran, the late Dr. Ravi Sankaran, who was a good friend. And uh, he had been studying uh, uh, these uh, swiftlets, these edible less swiftlets in the Andaman Islands. And through him, he opened up the whole of the Andamans to me and also it introduced me to all the people studying wildlife out there. So I met people who were studying crocodiles, people who were studying birds, people who were studying turtles. And all that really added so much to my research that I came up with good stories. Now, I'm just going to give you an example of the kind of uh, research that goes into storytelling. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a book, a couple of books I've written, Ladakh Adventure, and uh, another one, a follow-up book with the Snow Leopard Adventure. Now, when I went, when I wanted to write these books, uh, a little background, the Snow Leopard, of course, you know, there was that, uh, the, that wonderful book by Peter Matheson called The Snow Leopard. When I read that book, it just fascinated me about what we call the gray ghost of the Himalaya. This was, uh, I'm talking in the year 1998 when I read that book. And uh, in 2000, I went to research a story there. And I knew nobody in Ladakh. Uh, I just, but I did know Joanna. You know, Joanna Van Grissen? Uh, she helped me with my earlier book, Ranthambore Adventure. And Joanna's husband, Raghu, had been studying snow leopards. So I wrote to Joanna and said that, uh, look, I want to write a book on snow leopards. Uh, can you help me? And so she put me in touch with Raghu. And Raghu said, come along. Join me on this. This is Dr. Raghu Chundavat. Come and join me on my annual snow leopard expedition, where he, a lot of people from around the world would sign up and uh, they would pay their fees and that fees would help him. He would give them two weeks in India in, in the home of the snow leopard in the Ladakh range and try and find snow leopards for them to watch. And they would help him with his research and their money would also help fund further work on his end. So he called me for one of these uh, expeditions of his, and I learned a lot. I mean, that really gave me the full background about uh, uh, the, my book, Snow Leopard Adventures. I'm going to show you some, share with you some slides. Uh, Mohit, can we start the slideshow? Uh, or maybe I'll just, OK, here we are. Um, I think it starts with this. These were the two books, Ladakh Adventure and Snow Leopard Adventure. So I'd gone there uh, to, to write a story basically on Snow Leopard. But along with that, I also researched a story out on Ladakh, which is called Ladakh Adventure. It just happened to be two books instead of one that came out of this time I spent out there. I mean, uh, we all know that Ladakh is, an, uh, is on the northern side of the Himalayas in the sense that uh, when we approach the Himalayas from Delhi, we come to the foothills and then you come if you keep going north, you'll come to the ridge line, which includes Mount Everest and the world's tallest mountains. And then you drop down into Tibet, the roof of the world. Parts of Tibet belong to India, and uh, Ladakh is one of those parts. Of course, the parts of Sikkim belong to us. Uh, so we have bits and stretches of the uh, Tibetan plateau. And so this slide basically tells, shows you that you have to cross the Himalayas. These the wonderful peaks of the Himalayas to get to Ladakh, which lies on the other side, on the Tibetan plateau. 
Um, so next. All right, this is, uh, I guess, I generally give a lot of talks in school. So this particular talk shows you the Himalayan range starting from Bhutan in the east on your right, going through Nepal, Ut uh, Uttaranchal, Himachal, into Kashmir and Ladakh being in the Kashmir zone. All right. And uh, sorry to get used to this to be. With. So they say Ladakh is a desert, right? And if we look at this picture, which is taken in Leh, in the upper reaches of Leh, you think that where's the desert? It's all green. And uh, this is actually a summertime picture. If it go now, it'll all be white and covered with snow. Ladakh actually is a desert. As you can see in the mountain ranges behind, nothing growing out there. But there are a lot of mountains with glaciers on them and the Indus River and various other tributaries coming in through the Zanskar. And, uh, People basically live in the river basins where you can grow your crops and there's always water. But in the mountains, there's hardly anything growing out there. So next. All right. This is the River Indus going through the dark. And um, you can again see where the river is flowing. It's all green. But around you, I mean, if you're on the other side of the mountains are, there's nothing growing out there. Um, one second. So I spent a lot of time roaming around Leh. I was very lucky and the dark. In those days, this was before the movie Three Idiots came. I remember that when I asked for my ticket to Leh, you know, in those days you had travel agents, you, you couldn't go online and book your tickets. And I told my travel agent I'm going to Leh. And he completely misunderstood what I was talking about. He booked me a ticket to Lyon in France. <laughs> <laughs> they had no idea where Leh was in those days. And if you wanted to move around in Leh, you needed a lot of army backup, right? Because even today, you need a lot of army backup. The most, quite a few areas are close to civilians. And I was very lucky and living in Pune. I, you know, we have a lot of army presence out here. And uh, I got to know a gentleman by the name of Brigadier Samanwar. And he opened up the whole of Ladakh to me. And I traveled around a lot into various zones. And of course, this is a a photograph of uh, a Tibetan monastery. This is a Thikse monastery in near Leh. And uh, of course, the, the, the religion out here is that of the Dalai Lama. That is the uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhism. And uh, this is in the Sokar region. If you people have been there, this is the White Lakes of Sokar. You know, Ladakh is just a huge wilderness with these grasslands, with these mountains, uh, with these uh, with these freshwater lakes. We have a camp right out here. And this place is filled with birds at night. And uh, during the day also, you, you find them out here. And it was just, Ladakh was so beautiful that I said, I have to set a story, right? To, I just fell in love with Ladakh. And uh, the black neck cranes of, of Ladakh, I was very lucky to meet a gentleman by the name of uh, Meme Chako out there. He's, Meme basically means grandfather in, uh, in Ladakh. Uh, he's actually Colonel Tommy Chako. He used to finance his own trips and he uh, did a lot of research on these birds and he took me out to uh, see these birds and I was very lucky to see them. And I've really uh, in involved them in my stories out there. They play a major role in my stories. These are the Ladakhi people whom we call the Changpa. Uh, this area of this land uh, is, we call it uh, the Tibetan plateau. They call it the Changtang, which in their language means the Northern Plain. And these are the Changpas. And I spent a few days with them. You know, they heard sheep, they heard cattle, they heard uh, yaks. And, uh, you know, when you're researching a story, you just absorb everything in the sense that whatever is there, you meet people, you talk with them. If they allow you to sample their lifestyle, you go and stay with them. And I was very lucky to learn a lot about them by staying with them. Uh, then we also, you know, the Ragu strip, Ragu Jut Chundavat, who studies snow lepers out there, I went with him on that trip and along with a whole bunch of uh, people from New Zealand, uh, people from, uh, from England, people from America. And I think there was one German also out there. So we went on this trip 
to search for the snow leopard. You know, in summertime, what happens is what I learned out there, and which is what actually happens is that uh, uh, in winter, let's start with the winter. In the winter, the snow leopard, basically everything is iced up on the upper slopes. So they come down and they're found really at the, at the village levels and uh, they prey on the cattle of the people who live out there, the local people. But in summertime, everything opens up, the snow melts, and because of the snow melt in the higher regions, you get grass up there. And because there's grass up there, you get a whole bunch of uh, animals, the Ladakh Urial, uh, the blue sheep, uh, the ibex. You get all kinds of mountain goats and mountain sheep that go up there. And these are bit to eat that grass at the higher levels. And the snow leopard, basically, these are his prey. So he follows them up there. And so you find the snow leopard at very high altitudes where grass is found. So we had to go up there and all our equipment, the tent and the camp end on the back of these ponies. Um, so we were camped out out there. These are one of the earlier camps at the lower levels that I think are about 12 or 13,000 feet above sea level. And, uh, you know, in this picture, it looks like we're uh, clinging, uh, we are uh, posing for this photograph. The truth is that we are clinging on for dear life. Um, you know, it's you can see that Raghu has brought us up into areas where the snow leopard does, you know, his trails are found. But those paths are basically a foot or two wide. And if you make a mistake, you're going to fall right down to that valley behind you. In fact, that valley is uh, the Rumbak Valley. It's the river Rumbak. We were starting from its confluence with the Indus right back to its source. And that was uh, the route we were going to take to search for the snow leopard. Uh, so these were, you know, I was stunned by the vistas of the Himalayas and that photograph, this photograph basically shows you one tiny village, uh, uh, one home and it's called a village. It looks very incredibly beautiful when you see it in the, bathed in the sunshine out there and with the setting of the Himalayas behind. But you can imagine right now it's winter time, right? It's the northern, I mean, the northern hemisphere has got winter and out here, the temperatures in Ladakh right now, one of my friends is doing the Chador Trail. And she was saying that uh, it's minus 30 degrees Celsius. And it's, it's brutally cold out there. And the sun doesn't come down to these lower places where they are. So they don't even get sunshine. It's great to visit in summertime, but it is a hard life in winter. I can tell you that. Uh, this is uh, at around 16,000 feet where I told you the ice, the snow starts melting. And even though Ladakh is a desert, because of the melt of the snow melt, you get a lot of uh, grass at these levels. And this is what draws the, uh, the, the blue sheep and the oriole and, and the various uh, uh, mountain goats uh, which uh, roam these mountains. They come to eat this grass. And uh, so this is one of our, our high altitude camps. This is... Uh, you know, it's around 16,000 feet. You can see there's one lady who's sitting there in short pants. She's from Canada. But I'm very much from uh, Bombay and Pune, and I was freezing out there. I mean, this is summertime. This is in the Ladakh range. You can see the mountains just going out in the background. This is the home of the snow leopard. This is August, the warmest month in Ladakh. And this is in the afternoon and the sun is shining, the warmest time of day. And you can see what I'm wearing. This is about 16 to 17,000 feet up. It was cold. It was really cold up here. And here is around 18,000 feet. And we've, you can see there's a lot of grass where we are. And there's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, what do you call, blue sheep out here, baral. And the baral is called the blue sheep. Actually, it's not blue, it's more gray than blue, and it's not a sheep, but they somehow call it the blue sheep. But the Indian name for it is Baral, and there were about 100 to 200 Baral out here, and we had taken out all our cameras and telescopes, and uh, we were hoping to see a snow leopard out here that maybe it would come, you know? And uh, so that's why we all set out here. But also at the same time, Raghu was teaching us ecology and how to count the number of sheep, to note their activities, and you know, he taught us a lot of, uh, wildlife, uh, uh, how you go about you know, the various methods of uh, keeping track of wildlife out here. And uh, so we were all doing these sheep counts and animal counts and animal behavior, 
all that work we were doing. And these notes were being given to Raghu to use later on. Um, so here's a blue sheep. And you can see it out here. It's gone right to the very edge. And you know, very often when snow leopards attack, these animals go right to the very edge of the cliff because if the, if the snow leopard jumps on it, both the snow leopard and the sheep will fall to their death. So there's one way of uh, preserving themselves is going to the very edge. So this was uh, what I generally show to kids. Uh, this is June 1986, National Geographic. This photograph of one of the first uh, photographs ever of a snow leopard taken in the wild. It uh, basically was uh, such a famous photograph that I made of the cover of National Geographic at that time. You know, people had really not seen snow leopards in the wild that much, or gotten close enough to take good photographs. And this was one of the first. I mean, and actually, this picture was not taken by a human. It was, uh, it was like it's a camera trap where uh, the snow leopard put its foot on the pressure pad, which is connected to a camera and a flash. And uh, you could say that it was a selfie, all right? <laughs> it's one of the world's, one of the world's uh, first selfies of those times. I mean, a, a selfie from that time in 1986. And you can imagine, you can see the, the expression on the snow leopard's face. I mean, it's walking at around 20,000 feet where there's only starlight and there's complete darkness in complete wilderness. And suddenly this flash goes off in your face. And you can see the animal is startled. Um, that's another picture of the snow leopard. Uh, it's again, you can see the star, it's another selfie, and it's uh, kind of wondering what happened. And uh, this is uh, a wilderness picture, and you can see how beautiful this animal is. They say it's one of the most beautiful animals in the world, and it really is. I mean, it truly is a beautiful animal. Nowadays, there are a lot of uh, the snow leopards have become more visible. You know, some of these villages in the dark, what's happening is that uh, there was, a, I forget this young man's name, but uh, he, he's an ecologist and uh, he went up to some of the villages, which are, I, I don't remember the name of these villages, uh, but he went up there and he lived with these people and he saw how the snow leopards were predating their, uh, predating their animals. And so he managed to set up uh, insurance, uh, you know, a method of insuring the, the animals through getting funds from interna in, international funds in, in the sense that if a snow leopard killed the animal of, say, a, a goat or a sheep or a yak of a particular person, then he would arrange that the, the person be, would be compensated through insurance. And as this went on, people's, uh, you know, they, they disliked snow leopards because snow leopards, once they got into their pens where they kept their cattle, they have this habit of not killing one, but they would kill each and every animal inside there, though they'd only eat one. You know? And it, it was really, uh, it really uh, set them back economically. So they basically disliked snow leopards and they would kill them on site. But now with this insurance program that was brought in, uh, this whole, uh, the, attitude of the villagers changed to these snow leopards. And then they realized the next step, he told them that maybe you can, uh, you know, people are gonna come, they pay big money to just stay in your home, then you can act as guides and show them the snow leopards. And so what's been happening nowadays is that there's a lot of change in the way snow leopards were being seen by the locals. Now they understand that people wanna come and see them. And they see them as now, you can, you can advance economically by actually preserving snow leopards. And so now snow leopards are not being hunted that much and they're actually coming out and they are visible in these areas. And I have this photographer uh, friend of mine, Dhritaman Mukherjee, you know, he has been uh, crazy after snow leopards. And this is one of his pictures. Uh, there are other pictures that come about. Uh, so, you know, people are photographing snow leopards a lot nowadays. They're no longer invisible. They're actually very much visible in the dark. This is not the case in other parts of the world, but in Ladakh, where this, uh, where this thing about uh, tourism and seeing snow leopards has really uh, kicked off in a big way, snow leopards are no longer under threat. So this is just a little background on how I spent time in Ladakh, the kind of places I went to. I haven't really shown you the full uh, slideshow, which I generally give to kids, just picked up a few of them. But it was through this research, through this uh, 
spending time in Leh, going to Sokar, living with the Changpas, uh, moving around with them, then going up to search for the snow leopard. You know, Sam, just taking in the vistas of Ladakh, feeling the cold out there, uh, watching the stars at night, in the night which, is, which are incredibly sharp in the, in the rare air of the Himalayas. All this, you know, allows you to build a platform just to, to come up with a story. And this research has to be done really well. And I spent a lot of time there, met a lot of people. Raghu helped me a lot, Dr. Raghu Chandavat, and told me so much about snow leopards. Um, I didn't see a snow leopard on that expedition, but on further trips, I did see snow leopards. And I do remember when I first wrote this book, Snow Leopard Adventure, I really hadn't seen snow leopards, though I'd made all my attempts to see one. And I remember a kid asking me first up front, so have you seen a snow leopard? When I went to talk about my books, you know, and, uh, you know, promote my books. And this is the question that came to me. And I have to say that I told an untruth because if I told him that I hadn't seen a snow leopard, he would say, so what's this book all about if you haven't seen one? I did see them later on. And, uh, but uh, yeah, so all this effort went into uh, this book. And like this, my Ranthambore book, my uh, Sayadri adventure books, uh, my uh, Lakshadweep adventure books, my Anderman stories. I, would, I spend a lot of time researching these books. And I do enjoy the entire process of, you know, I love it actually, going out, uh, living in the wilderness, being in the company of people who are studying uh, birds or animals up there, basically ecologists working up there, wildlifers, researchers. The whole process is wonderful. And then the next process is coming up with a story, which is where the hard work starts. And then the even harder work is actually writing it. But the fun part is researching it. So I'm going to move on. So these are the books, Ladakh Adventure. They're published now by uh, Penguin. And uh, this here is the Snow Leopard Adventure. And uh, I'm going to talk, to, this is some of the other books I've written, Lakshadweep Adventure. Uh, Rantambor Adventure. These are two stories set in the Sayadri. The Sayadris are essentially our Western Ghats. And living in Pune, actually, the Sayadris are in my backyard. In fact, I just came back from the Sayadris to give this talk. So I don't get, I have a farmhouse in that area, but you don't get good connections. So I came back to Pune to give this talk to you. Um, so uh, these are the Sayadri books. And there's the Andaman stories. You know, all these books were originally published by Silverfish, which is part of Westland. Now, all of them are being transferred to Penguin. So we're re-releasing these books uh, over a period of time. An island, again, part of the Andaman stories. Now, I've come up with a new series for younger kids. All my earlier books were meant for older kids, and a lot of adults also read my books and enjoy them. This series is actually meant for younger kids, which I'm talking about uh, nine, 10 year olds, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11. You know, when they, you know, when you start reading books for kids, they start with picture books, right? Where you have these big pictures and maybe one line written out there. And I, if you, if you, if there are parents out here and, uh, you have children who are very young. I advise you to pick up a lot of picture books and you know read with them. It's a wonderful experience. You're spending quality, quality time with your kid. And these books are so educative within them that you learn so much. You, It becomes a family thing. And this the memory stays forever with the kids. And then this actually introduces them to books. And when they move on from picture books, they move on to, to chapter books, You know the bigger books. But there's an in-between, between picture books and chapter books. You have books which have got a lot of writing, but a lot of pictures also. And I've always wanted to write stories on birds. Because kids, what do they know? They know about crows. They know about pigeons. They might know about sparrows. They might know about minas, bulbuls, kites. But you know, we have 1,200 species of birds in India, right? You know, they don't know about pelicans, they don't know about golden orioles, they don't know about cranes, they don't know about uh, uh, storks, they don't know about uh, uh, the whole, there's so many birds that we have out here. 
and I just found it was very sad that kids have no idea of these beautiful birds that we have in our country. And uh, I thought that maybe if I wrote books, which are basically about birds, but they would be really well illustrated, so well illustrated that if a kid or the reader saw the bird in an illustration in the book and saw that same bird in the wild, they'd be able to connect. You know, these would be very realistic illustrations. And uh, so I, Penguin, and have a series of books for younger kids. They call the Puffin series. So these books have been published under the Puffin series and they're all about birds. Birds are the characters. And there are lots and lots of illustrations. There are lots and lots of different birds which I bring in through these books. And I'm hoping that as the series develops, we have four books out in the series, uh, that there will be a lot of books about birds and, and the series will grow. And I'm hoping that children will learn a lot about birds and hopefully fascinate them enough to become bird watchers. That's really the goal of these stories. So let me give you a little background about these books. Um, so I've written this one called Talon the Falcon. Uh, another one called Flamingo in my Garden. The Paradise Flycatcher and The Golden Eagle. These are the four books out till now. I'll just give a little background quickly through some of these books and what they're about. And I'll show you some of the illustrations in the book just to share with you. So starting with Talon the Falcon this is the first one. You know, this image of birds in cages, I just hate this. It makes it, it, you feel so bad for these birds that, you know, God gave them wings to travel to any part of this globe. You can go any part of this world, which we cannot, but they can just go anywhere they want. And we put them in these cages. I think it's the worst thing possible. It's, it's just a terrible, terrible crime. And what this book really addresses, it's a story about a peregrine falcon, which is uh, kept in a cage. And, you know, through the story, I make it come out that, you know, birds in cages sing a very sad song over and over and over again. And how a squirrel, I, I, I'm not going to go into the details, but the squirrel essentially has been brought up by a bulbul. And therefore, this is the only squirrel in the whole world that can speak the bird language. And this squirrel hears this, this song, the sad song of this peregrine falcon about being locked up in a cage and that its wings are gone and can never use them again. And how his compassion for the bird leads to how, you know, because peregrine falcons actually eat squirrels for breakfast, right? So it takes a lot of bravery for a squirrel to go and rescue a falcon, particularly if the falcon can eat him up. But the, the story comes out through this. Here's yeah, this a picture I often show to kids that how would it be if you were stuck in a cage, not for just a for a few hours and not for just one day or for a week or a month or a year, but for your entire life. And that's what we do to birds. So here it is, you know, and this is that song which this peregrine falcon is singing in its cage. You know, this cage, this awful creation of man, barred from freedom forever I am. No sunlight, no moonlight, no starlight for me, no sky, no, you know, it goes on, you know, it's a very sad song. And that's what, you know, there is this squirrel, it lives in this way. You can see this white headed squirrel lives in a place called the Rose Garden. You see in the picture, there are some humans involved in the story. This white headed squirrel has a great friend in this girl called Mitali. Um, this is Mitali and her mother. Uh, the series is set in a place called the Rose Garden. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, the bulbul, who is another great. This is the one who brought up the squirrel as his own child. This, and I show this. I mean, I don't need to show this picture to this audience. They know what a red cheek bulbul is all about. But to kids, I tell them which are the different birds. This is the white-headed squirrel, and these are his other friends. And they're pointing at the cage, which is at the back, where there's a peregrine falcon. And these squirrels are so scared of peregrine falcons that. They can't even see the bars of the cage. That, that is, that's how scared they are. And they feel it's going to come and attack them and eat them up. And uh, these are just illustrations from the book. And uh, this is usually I give for kids. 
So I'm just, we all know these birds, of course, so I'm not really going into them. Sunbirds and how they've got these big beaks and how they hover. Then the drongo and the green beaters. You know, I'm just quickly going through these. And this is the fountain where they all gather every day to exchange gossip. Um, the drongo. And this is the image of the squirrel. Uh, the magpie robin and the bulbul, and they're looking at that cage. And it's late at night when birds are fast asleep, except for the owl, of course, and the night birds. But these are day birds, and the squirrel they're generally fast asleep at this time. But they want to rescue this uh, this peregrine falcon, which is singing the sad song. And so, how that rescue takes place, what happens, that's all part of the story. Um, Flamingo in my garden. Actually, the story was. Uh, it, uh, you know, it came to me because, you know, in Mumbai, which is my old home, and which I go to a lot often, uh, you know, you have all these uh, flamingos that live there, right? But, you know, most people in Mumbai don't even know that the flamingos are there, living in the mud flats now in Sivri or uh, further north in the Thane region. Uh, they don't even know that they have hunt thousands upon thousands of flamingos living there. And so the story was more about a Mumbai flamingo which goes missing, all right? I'm not gonna go into the story, but uh, these are some of the images I show kids. And this is a shot of the Mumbai flamingos in the mud flats. Um, and uh, these are some of the illustrations from the story. As you can see, this is a marine drive in Bombay and the story is set in Bombay and it's about a flamingo. Actually comes to this place called the Rose Garden at night, I mean during the day. And this girl, Mitali, cannot believe that they have a flamingo in their garden because flamingos don't, they generally travel in big groups. They, they, they never travel singly and they're coming to a garden. They never do that. But, and they're stunned when they see a, a flamingo in their garden. But, you know, the flamingo at night returns to Mumbai to the mud flats. And here he is returning with the moon shining on the sea and suddenly realizes that if he lands back in his... Uh, amongst all the sleeping flamingos, he would scare them and they would all get up at night and he doesn't want to do it you know, because he doesn't want to scare 10,000 flamingos. So he turns back and he goes back to the rose garden and here they all gather at the fountain and the flamingo tells a story. I mean, not, I mean there's a, the wagtail is sitting right in the center and he tells the story of how we rescued this flamingo. And uh, so that's what uh, this book is about, about the flamingo that went missing. And here's the wagtail, which tells the story. And these are the seagulls of Mumbai who play a big role in the story. And you know, this is a typical scene from Mumbai, uh, a launch, a motor launch going out to the islands, the Elephanta Islands and giving a tour around the harbor and how seagulls in this part in winter time, they have a lot of seagulls out here and how they follow these birds and these uh, this is typically what happens on a daily basis in Mumbai. And these are scenes from the story. Here they're flying over the Bandra uh, sea link. And here you have uh, the male and female, uh, how would you call, uh, now here I, here I go again. <laughs> you know which these birds are, quails, the male and female quails. And you have the owl out here. It's all part of the story. But these illustrations you can see are done really well. And here's the flamingo flying past the gateway of Mumbai. And of course, the paradise flycatcher, you know, this bird is a fascinating bird. And uh, I just thought that the beauty of this bird can really get kids into birds. And therefore I chose this bird as a central theme for writing a story called the paradise flycatcher. Again, these are just images from of flycatchers. And here, you know, I shouldn't be giving the story out here, but the squirrel goes missing and all these birds gather around at the fountain every evening and they're wondering where the squirrel has gone. And even the girl, Mitali, she's missing her squirrel. And uh, there's a boy who lives next door. Actually, I'm not gonna go deep into the story, but here are images from the story. As you can see, these images are done really well, you know, and, uh, so here we have the sunbird and uh, you know, from this you can actually uh, 
make out there's a purple drum sunbird and you can see this in the in the wild there can be a connection so we put a lot of effort into these uh, illustrations we make sure that the right size the proportions are correct the colors are correct uh, here we have a whole bunch the minivets uh, the indian roller uh, the kingfisher common kingfisher you know and the drongo so and there's an ayora there also the story has a human angle to it also mitali in class and uh, i'm not going deeper into it but these are some of the images and uh, they find that you know these are all just images from the story the birds fly down to the southern forests here they meet the racket-tailed drongo and they meet uh, leaf birds and uh, they meet the hornbills and uh, from here so you know there are various different birds that come in with a lot of illustrations and here the children are being led by the birds and they rescue the squirrel so that's part of the story uh the paradise fly catcher and the golden eagle of course there's images from that story i'm not good there's i'm i really have a very good artist and he does a brilliant job and here is the golden eagle carrying the squirrel um the story images from the story um quickly going through some of them open bill storks and here you have a whole bunch of birds black neck stork talking to the doves okay so pelicans yellow footed green pigeons all scenes from the story and that's the golden eagle so i think this is the last of the slides uh so i was just giving you a little background on so the books i've written and the process that goes into it uh, you know what has happened is over the years a lot of schools have discovered these books as wildlife stories uh, as uh, you know set in different parts of india adventure stories and many schools and when we were kids we used to get all these uh, foreign books to read as as readers and what has happened is now a lot of schools have want to use indian books as readers so i have more than 100 schools that use these books as readers as part of their schools and uh, and now this new series of the feather tail series is also catching on and uh, yeah it's been a great journey this writing and uh, my next book in the for older kids is possibly going to do with dolphins we have a lot of dolphins on our coastline the indo pacific humpback dolphin I've been researching stories, meeting people who study these dolphins. That might be the next book, and of course, there'll be more books in the feather tail series. So this goes on, and I thoroughly enjoy this process. Um, so I'm stopping my slide presentation. Um, if there is, uh, are there any questions? I'm there to answer them. Mohit, are you there? Yes, absolutely. This is so fascinating. You know, I remember when I. Read that uh, uh, book of yours, which has a falcon in it. My eyes welled up, you know, and I had to go through that section twice, you know, over to, you know, it was so heart wrenching. It was so beautiful, and I Thank also, to, yeah, I also want to tell you, you know, it brought back uh, uh, the memories of my first snow leopard um, uh, experience. You know, I wasn't even out to look for snow leopards. There was this bunch of kids from Cambridge University, and they were we were traveling through Spiti, and that time there were hardly any hotels, and we were camping along Linti just after Dankar, and uh, you know I had to sort of kick them into their tents because they weren't going to sleep, and they were all blue stuff. <laughs> so I said you need to go get into bed because we have a long journey to cover the next day. We were supposed to be camping in Batan the next day, crossing Kunzumla. And then, uh, so so I used to smoke those days, and I was sitting, you know, I sort of put the, uh, you know, I was leaning against the tire of a Tata mobile, and I was looking at the river, you know, Spiti was flowing in front of me, we were camping right there, and it was a moonlit night, and I saw something jumping into the water on the other end. I said, oh, what is that? At two o'clock in the morning, who could be swimming, swimming across? You know, and it's a fast flowing river. Then that thing kept swimming, and it came out of the water, and 
and I didn't know what it was because I wasn't expecting anything like snow leopard. And it sort of shook its coat vigorously to get the water off. And it started to walk right towards me, you know, because it was, you know, it was like, it probably didn't notice that there was a car and there was this man sitting right against it uh, along the tire. So I had to put this cigarette back to my lips and, you know, to, to show a uh, little bit of that, you know, light to that leopard. And then the moment it saw it, it came pretty close to me and it bolted. And it bolted, went on. It was those 10 seconds where I, I mean, I have no words to speak because, you know, I, I can't yeah. articulate that experience. That's but, a fascinating story. That really is a fascinating story. I wish I'd had that experience. It, it just yeah. sounds like a fairy tale kind of uh, setting. It was. Yeah, I, I had no expectations of a snow leopard and I didn't know that I'd be able to see one. And our intention was to go and see uh, Yogesha the Nima's work, uh, you know, into, into Pin Valley the next day. But that was my snow leopard experience. Fantastic. Uh, so. Lucky man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, friends, um, we've got uh, some time left and I want people to ask their questions. I posted the article uh, it's, a, it's a blog written by um, uh, by deepak and i posted the link here so you could open that in a new window and then read it later and in the meantime just go ahead and ask whatever questions that you've got you could write your questions in um, in the chat box and then deepak would answer oh deepak i've got one question for you sure what if if I want to order these books and I want to uh, send them to my guests, my clients, even for my own collection, I have a few of yours from for my own collection, but if I want more, how does one go about procuring these online? Right. That's a good question, actually, because now some of the books are available, some are not, because we're actually in the process of transferring them from uh, Westland publishers to Penguin publishers. So all the four Feather Tales books are available on Amazon, are available from bookshops. They're all available anywhere and everywhere. You can pick them up. For my eight books, which are the Adventure Series books, two, four of them have been published uh, as Penguin books. One is Rantambor Adventure. The other one is Ladakh Adventure, Snow Leopard Adventure, and Lakshadweep Adventure. These four books are available in the market. The remaining four, by year end, these will be made available in the market. So yes, I have written 12 books. At this point, eight are available, the entire Feather Tales series and f half the Adventure series are available. We are actually rewriting the books and converting them to Penguin books. And so that's a process, you know, and that will happen through this year. The remaining four will come out. So, but they're available everywhere. You know, Penguin is great at uh, distribution. So they're in your bookshops, it's there uh, on Amazon, on Flipkart, whatever there are the methods of selling books. I should ask Ravi Singh for a uh, few of those copies, you know, while he's still there with <laughs> Penguin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so Harpreet says, uh, have you written books on big cats? Yes, uh, Snow Leopard, uh, you know, which he just talked about. Uh, and he's also written uh, on Rantham World Adventure. So yeah, see, Snow Leopard is considered a small cat. The big cat is Tiger, of course. I mean, uh, I wrote Ranthambore Adventure a long, long time back. Of, you know, what was happening in those days, particularly uh, when the Chinese, uh, they, they made their tiger go extinct uh, in the 80s, where the South China tiger essentially went extinct, and they still needed bones for their medicines, their traditional Chinese medicines, or they most important ingredients is tiger bone. And when they couldn't get any more from their own tigers, they started looking at, at India. And at that time, our numbers of tigers just plummeted. We didn't know what was going on. And it was then, when I was reading all this, I thought that I had to write a book on tigers and find out what poaching was happening. And I went and met Valmik Thapar. I spent a lot of time with Fateh Singh Rathor. Uh, I walked in the forest of Ranthambore. And uh, so this book, Ranthambore Adventure, came out as a result of that. And basically, it was spurred by what was happening and the disappearing, disappearance of tigers in that, at that time. So, yes. Yes. That's when, we, when, when Lynn Fernandez um, put a case against 
the government and said, where are the tigers? And then during that monsoon period, Ashokji sent me to Rantambor and I stayed in, you know, half flooded Kamdenu complex to mm -hmm. do some fact finding for traffic India. You know, that right. is when, you were with traffic, yeah. <laughs> I was with traffic then. So those yeah. were the days. So in fact, Ashok at that time was uh, with yeah. Belinda, right? So I yeah, met him through Belinda in, in those yeah, days. But, yeah, they were French, but but Belinda had not started WPSI then. And but I, I met him later on when they were together working at WPSI. Yes, 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 yes great. I, uh, you know, uh, you might want to tell people um, how do you research your uh, stories? You know, or what are the key ingredients? So you know, research is such an invaluable tool because you learn so much about the place and the story you want to write. Uh, like, for example, uh, run, the story in Rantambo that I said, um, I, I spoke to Valmik. Valmik uh, did, told me a few things, and you know, but uh, he's not a great communicator. So I mean, you know, he, uh, so, but he told me, meet these people. And he sent me to Fateh. Fateh was the most incredible uh, 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 storyteller. And he told me stories right through the night and he wouldn't yeah. stop. And he was just brilliant at it. He's such a wonderful gentleman. Uh, but at that time, there was a person called Mr. Reddy. I think you might remember him. He was, uh, he, he was, uh, I think, the RFO of the range at that time. Yeah. And uh, so I told him, sir, I want to write a book on tigers. Uh, and I need to get inside the sanctuary. You know, I can't sit and write a story by, unless I come inside. So do you mind if I come inside? He said, sure, you can come, but you have to go in one of the jeeps because the only way, nobody's allowed to walk in the sanctuary. And that's a fact, nobody's allowed to walk. Uh, so he said, you'll have to sit in one of the jeeps and go around and you can research your story. I said, sir, if I go in a jeep, a diesel jeep, you go taka, 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 I'll never hear the sounds of the forest. And instead of smelling the fresh air of the forest, I'll smell diesel. And there'll be sand and dust and muck. I'm not going to experience the forest if I want to Talk, write a story about a forest, I got to walk in there, I got to spend time in there, you know. He said, Deepak, that's against the rules. And I can't let you do that. But while I, he was talking to me, it, I got a sense that he let me know in the sense, if you go in and you go in with the right people, I'll look the other way. And that was, he was a real, he was one of the few people who really helped out at that level. Yeah. And so I spent yeah. time in the forest and uh, that's how the whole story came out. Of course, I met Belinda, I met Ashok, I learned about the movement of the tiger bone, I learned about the poaching, not as much as probably you know, Mohit, but uh, I did learn quite a bit and that's how the story came about. But, you know, research is one of the most important things in the stories. Um, my Andaman stories, I spent months out there. I wanted to write a story which included the Jarawa, you know, and the Jarawa are the last of the living original Negrito people who are from that air area. But you're not allowed to meet them. Nobody's allowed to go and meet them. I remember my first trip, I, though I want to write a story on the Jarawa, I, I was just not allowed to meet them. Then later on, because of my army connections, I got to know somebody who was, who was posted there as the head of the Tri-Command, you know, the Army, Navy, and Air Forces, has one uh, person as the, this thing. And he said, Deepak, what do you want to do? <laughs> he just opened all the doors. I managed to spend two, three nights in the Jarawa. I, I managed to travel to areas which I could never have traveled. And that's how the stories came about. But you need to spend time. Research is the most important thing because the research gives you great ideas also. Ideas you would have never thought of to bring into the story and to weave into your stories. So research is the whole and soul of the story. The next step is the writing, of course. So the research is the most important. Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, sometimes when you you feel that you you come to a roadblock and you have you you cannot move further with your research, there are still chances of writing great stories. And you could write, you know, I I have, I have firmly believe that you could write a story on your failure, that you were trying to arrive at this thing, but it didn't happen because there was a road roadblock. But instead, I got this, which is, yeah. you know, and then the story takes a different turn. Takes a completely unexpected turn, yeah. and that's the beauty of it. You don't know you set out with something will land up somewhere else. Correct. So Charu asked this question. You know, do you think it's important to stay in these places to write about them with a regular teaching job? It seems difficult. So how can I go about it? So Charu, I just said that it could just take a different turn. 
you start to do it and the world will start to open itself you know this is how it works for me you got to be you know you have to the, the, you have to step out of your own uh, this thing cycle of life etc you have to go out and make it happen you have to be brave and when you go out there things happen you know you don't know where you go great things can happen but it's not going to happen by sitting at home you have to get out there yeah. and you may, maybe you can't do it in the short period of the time there but if you go very often the experiences add up and as the experiences add up you suddenly become that platform is built and you can write that story yeah so absolutely that's wonderful so you think children are very receptive now and they uh, they they have lots of takeaways from these stories and they're looking at conservation wildlife conservation and they these stories sort of move them to adopt or change their ways of life through different thought process you know well, children are indignant they is their point of view why can't you stop the killing why can't you stop the forest being knocked out and whatever reasons you give them doesn't just doesn't work with them they said this is nonsense you have to stop so they get very upset you know and uh, i think at this stage if they learn what's going wrong as they get older it's you already implanted it there you know uh, yeah. so that's what these stories do it exposes them to something which they had no idea they had no idea the kids tigers are being killed for their bones you know uh, so this comes into them uh, or that uh, you know snow leopards are fine, their, their survival is being threatened by us and our activities all these things come through through the stories and they don't come in the form of a lecture Yeah. and that's the most important thing for kids it comes without them even knowing that it's coming and that that goes deepest within them that's why stories are so important yeah absolutely absolutely this is brilliant and it was absolutely fantastic uh deepak we've gone two minutes past our finishing time so you think we should say goodbye to everyone and um It was it was really really wonderful. I think it was uh, it was really enlightening. I think it was um, uh, for me it was moving. I I managed to go back in time. I I was transported back to those areas where I feel I belong. And and your stories did that. Thank you Thank so you much, Deepak. Thank, Thank you, boy. Thanks for the opportunity. It's wonderful communicating with uh, your friends. And uh, thanks again. So, Deepak, one thing: if people want to get in touch with you, can they find you on Facebook? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, I have an email which I can share with you if you like. Yeah, uh, if you tell me now, I will. I will put it here. Yeah, it's D N D as in do not disturb. D N yes. D followed by Dalal. D A L A L. D N D Dalal. At gmail dot com. Correct. That's where it is. Okay, okay. I have put that in. Chatya, and I have a website www.dipakdalal.com. Oh, that's easy to remember. Okay, I'll just put this here as well. Yeah. And this. you can communicate through that also. There's a gateway from there to send me a message. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mohit. Thanks. 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 Bye. Bye.